we are live a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 243 squint and pediatric ophthalmology lecture number 30 today we have with us the young and dynamic dr amar pujari sir from rp center aims uh, talking to us on anomalies of convergence and divergence the chair for tonight are dr amitava sir and uh, dr pradeep sharma sir i invite dr pradeep sharma sir to please welcome our speaker and introduce him to our audience thank you shefali it's really a great pleasure to welcome and introduce dr amar who has been a student with us and then now an assistant professor uh, he is one of the most uh, scholastic sincere and a uh, very noble person uh, i think he uh, is one of the uh, hallmarks of what one would expect a student to be and he has made me proud so much he did his mbbs from karnataka institute of medical sciences hubli karnataka and then md ophthalmology from rp center aims PubMed index publications, 139 citations, 561 H index 11. So it's something which is just beyond understanding that his young age, he has done so much. Pioneering work, new, newer surgical approaches in strabismus, imaging in strabismus, novel wet lab residency training modules, lenticular imaging. Uh, with smartphones, he has done so much magic in photography. It's really remarkable. He has got several awards to his credit. AIS Science Vision Award for Smartphone Innovations in 2020, International Hero Award in 2019, Best Publication Award 2021, Best Free Paper Award 2021, Best Surgical Video Award 2021, The Doss AC Agarwal Trophy in 2019, Arjun Narang Award 2021, Invited Speaker from Japanese Glaucoma Society to Present Smartphone Innovations in Glaucoma 2020, Invited Speaker from APAO 2023 to Present Work on ASOCT in Strabismus. so he is really a great speaker and we are looking forward to this complex topic that he is going to cover today the disturbances of convergence and divergence so over to amar please share your screen thank you sir thank you for kind introduction and uh, i want to thank uh, pradeep sharma sir and amitava sir and also pradeep santosh sharma sir for uh, this opportunity <clears throat> is my slide visible yes yes thank you sir so good evening everyone uh, so i will be talking on anomalies of convergence and divergence so convergence and divergence are very common phenomena which we encounter in our daily visual processes so we need them for reading writing and all possible near and distance activities including the whatever the slides we are seeing right now so we are converging to a certain extent so it is very important to understand what is convergence and what is divergence and what are the probable anomalies which can affect any person so convergence is a type of disconjugate or disjugate eye moment to maintain the binocular single vision so what is disjugate eye moment so as we know our visual system is made in such a way that we are going to understand we are going to uh, tell about the visual axis as if the eyes are going to be in a uh, completely parallel position so if the visual directions are going to cross each other they are going to make dissection to each other so for example if the eyes are looking on the right gaze we are going to call that as a dextroversion so in that one right eye is abducting and the left eye is adducting so still the visual axis are remaining parallel to each other so in this case convergence or divergence the visual axis are going to cross each other they are able to dissect each other that's why you call this one as a disjugate eye moment here you can see in this diagram the visual directions of each eye are pointing or meeting at a point so what is the pattern for this convergence it's a more of a reflex right so the inner visions for the upper and pathway begins at the medial lactus muscle which is going to reach the fifth nerve nucleus that is mesencephalic nucleus from where it is going to reach the convergence center which is there in the tectal or the pretectal region for from that region the innervations are going to get conveyed to the edinger westphal nucleus which is the efferent pathway for the third nerve nuclei right so once the message or the innervations which reach the edinger westphal nucleus it's going to be conveyed to the subsequently intranuclear pathway that is along the third nerve path and it reaches the ciliary ganglia and it's going to innervate the medial lactus as well as other uh, apparatus like accommodative apparatus as well as the pupillary fibers so why do we need convergence because as we are human beings we are going to work with the cyclopean eye so even though we have right and the left eye so whatever the things we are appreciating whatever the things we are able to see right now we are going to perceive them as 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 if we are going to see through the 
third eye of the cyclopean eye so in addition the orbits the nature had made the orbits in such a way that they are slightly in a exorbitism they are, they are slightly laterally placed so that's why the eye needs to be slightly rotated inwards that's what we call as a convergence so if you understand the anatomy between the orbit and the globe orbital axis is slightly abducted and the globe needs to be slightly brought inwards so if you understand the axis between the eye and the orbit it is slightly or more or like more or less around 23 degrees so the globe needs to be rotated inwards just to achieve the binocular single vision right so what are the different types of convergence so we have accommodative convergence on the right side you can see the lens lens is one of the factor which stimulates the convergence whenever there is an image which is falling very uh, inaccurately or if it is blurred if it is blurred so it's going to stimulate the convergence just to achieve the clear image on the retina so that is first type of convergence second type of convergence is when i am going to see something in front of me sometimes you might have noticed that when you are going to see some text on the uh, smartphone or something very near to you you feel that sometimes it's going to be double so you are going to blink few times and you are going to be bring the fusional convergence just to make the things single so we want to achieve the binocular single we want to fuse that one so that is the second type of convergence that is fusional convergence the third is a sense of proximity so whenever some insect is going to come in front of you it's going to sit on your nose so immediately you will be anxious so you want to just avoid that one so a proximal convergence will come into action and it will suggest just there is a threat you need to get rid of that one so that is a sense of proximity will induce some kind of convergence that is proximal convergence fourth is as i said previously the orbits are made in such a way that they are slightly in a uh, laterally positioned things so we need to have a tonus along the medial rectus muscle compared to lateral rectus muscle so that will allow the slight inward rotation of the globe so that's how we are able to rotate the globe in a natural way towards the cyclopean eye so one thing about symmetric and asymmetric convergence so it is nothing but when the target is in the sagittal position it is straight ahead gaze it's in the direction of the cyclopean eye so whatever the inner vision which flows along the medial rectus muscle is going to be equal so that is called as symmetric convergence so for example if something is lying on to your right side so probably your mobile is ringing on the right side right now so without turning your head you want to look there so in that case whatever the innervation which goes to right medial lactose muscle is going to be less compared to the left medial lactose muscle. So this is one concept you need to understand when there is a need for symmetric convergence and when there is a need for asymmetric convergence. So how to assess it? We want to measure it. Even though we can see this one, visual axes are able to dissect each other. This is a type of disconjugate eye moment. But we need to put everything into a first a normative data. Then we can assess what is pathological and what is physiological, right? So whenever patients, we do encounter patients with uh, convergence anomalies. So whenever you encounter this kind of patients, so you need to have a quick look just to uh, say whether it is a really convergence problem or something else. So here in your quick OPDs, you can just uh, ask the patient to fix it at your finger or a pencil tip. So you can just take the pencil tip towards their uh, eyes and you can see, you can ask. Uh, when the thing is uh, appearing double so you can just approximately measure the distance and you can just guess whether it's a convergence insufficiency or not so probably beyond certain distance they are able to say that no i am seeing the pen as double so that could be an initial hint that they could be having convergence insufficiency so how to measure it so whatever the pen and other things we are going to use that is a very rough or a very easy clinical uh, measurement modality but when you want to document that one when you want to treat the patient when you want to continue the same measurements whether the patient is improving or not it is better to go for a definitive measurement so that is our rif ruler royal air force ruler so a uh, few other instruments are also there but this is very quickly available with uh, almost every clinician so here on the right side you can see this has two prongs which are going to sit on the either side of the nose and it has a vertical uh, vertical bar and it has a rotating square drum so we can uh, have so many targets on this one you can see here there are sentences let us at varied sizes and it's going to have even one line single line so just to understand how we are going to measure the accommodation and convergence so basically we are going to measure the nearest point of accommodation and the nearest point of convergence because we are re really interested in that one of course we can measure the range also we can measure the amplitude also so if you want to uh, measure amp uh, accommodation and convergence you need to uh, just remember the formula a b c d Accommodation is indicated by blurring and convergence is indicated by diplopia. So we are going to choose the letters here 
right so accommodation you are going to test with the unilateral as well as bilateral so when you are testing bilaterally you are going to ask the subject to look at the letters and uh, tell uh, you, are, you are going to ask him tell me when you are going to see them blurred so you need to move that drum slowly towards the nose so when patient is able to say i am seeing it clearly at certain point of time he is going to say i am seeing them blurred so that is the indicative of totally this is a near point of accommodation so similarly you can check by uh, covering one eye by covering left eye you can just move and you can assess what is the nearest point of accommodation with the right eye similarly with the left eye so if you want to check the convergence you can rotate the drum uh, patients are able to appreciate the line better where like they can see the line easily splitting of the line that is diplopia so once you are moving the drum towards the patient's eye at some point of time he is going to say that i am seeing the line as double so that is the point of nearest point of convergence so you can just look on this bar you will be having a measurements in terms of centimeters right so if you measure that one so that will give what is the nearest point of convergence so what is normal and what is abnormal usually clinically we consider between 8 to 10 cm as the nearest point of convergence which is normal and of course it applies to second and third decade subjects so if you are going to measure uh, in first decade that means between 5 to 10 years it could be very less even it could be 5 5 cm or 6 cm so similarly if you are measuring beyond third decade it could be receding because that is age related uh, insufficiency in convergence so on an average we consider 8 to 10 cm young patient as a adolescent most uh, particularly as a normal this thing near point of convergence so anything beyond 10 to 12 cm is considered as a receding near point but uh, there is no actual cutoff line we need to take the patient concerns uh, into consideration we have seen that patients are having 12 or even 14 centimeters of nearest point of convergence still they are not symptomatic so we need to put together both the things so that is nearest point of convergence and what patient needs or what is the symptom he really has so when you uh, understand both the concepts i feel then we'll be able to address the patient better so what are the clinical analogy which can affect the convergence first one is convergence insufficiency second one is convergence insufficiency with accommodative insufficiency third one is convergence paralysis and fourth one is convergence spasm so here you can see on the right side the two eyes are there and there's a near point that is normal so when it is receded back when patient is not able to converge when he is not able to see the very near things so it's going to go back it's going to recede so that is convergence insufficiency so that will be beyond 12 cm or even 15 cm so what will be uh, clinical features as patient is not able to converge obviously he is not able to see the things clearly so that will lead to a kind of doubling or blurring so because of that patient is going to have blurred vision and which will lead to difficulty in reading all the mobile text and whatever the reading books so whatever the things he is going to read for near so that will be very difficult for him because of that one he is going to use the convergence excessively that he will end up with headache which is going to be a very constricting a bad type of headache and because of that patient is going to be very disturbed he's going to lose his concentrations and uh, because of this one he is going to have a disturbance in his personal life including sleep disturbances so what are the causes for this sort of uh, convergence insufficiency so if you look into the uh, most common cause it could be like patient has uncorrected refractive error that is the most common cause for uh, this kind of symptoms so you need to correct it for example if patient or the kids or the adolescents have up to four to five adapter they will do uh, excessive convergence and they will try to compensate that refractive error so you just need to do refraction so in those cases whatever the refraction is coming you need to just give that refractive error but some patients who are having more than five adapter plus five adapter hypermetropia they may not converge at all so in those cases if somebody is making excessive effort they might end up with uh, astronomic symptoms or if they are having uh, like desire to neglect that one they may not uh, converge uh, they may not do con convergence they might end up with uh, no astronomic symptoms so similarly corrected refractive errors if you if you correct the press by pain 40 or like 50 years uh, patients so whatever the convergence tendency they had like just to give the bifocals now they are not able to they are not using their accommodation as well as convergence so that way it can like just suppress the whatever the natural mechanism was there so once they take out the glasses and whatever the convergence they had they might feel that no no my convergence point has receded so they might present with convergence insufficiency and most of the times as we know it is going to be idiopathic without any significant intraocular or intracranial pathology so how to test it as i previously said you can just grossly uh, screen the thing using a pencil tip in the clinic and you need to measure it and document it in terms of numericals probably preferably using a rf ruler so in addition to that one as i previously said patient could be having refractive error 
and myopic patient may not be having any convergence at all because they are not, they are going to see the things which are very clear for the near uh, but hypermetro particularly they are going to end up with some sort of like deviation or even like prominently a synovic symptom so in those cases is appropriate uh, a cycloplegic should be used and we should uh, get refraction done so whatever the deviation uh, whatever the refractive error he has we need to give that one so in addition we can stimulate the convergence we can just improve upon that one by giving convergence exercises so it could be a pencil push up exercise or it could be a uh, whatever the uh, ideas cases we give fusional convergence exercise we can give that one or we can even recommend uh, convergence exercise on uh, Sinatra 4. So in addition, when some patients are not going to improve, uh, similarly, subsequently, I will cover those things in uh, convergence paralysis and all those things. So you can give basin prisms or even, even you can give bifocals where you want to just relax the accommodation and whatever the accommodation induced conversion is just to want to relax. So whenever patient has that sort of complaint, you need to give bifocals. So convergence insufficiency association accommodative accommodation insufficiency. So these are very rare scenarios. Uh, previously, this has been described in some kind of diphtheria and like whenever there's a neurotoxin or neurological issues also will also present with both the deficiencies. So in that case, whatever the convergence, which is there, which is hampered because of the uh, lesser tone along the medial lactose muscle, here patient is also having a lesser functioning length. So he's not able to accommodate also. That is a, another additive factor which will uh, irritate the patient. So in those cases, you want to measure the near point of convergence as well as near point of accommodation. So as uh, I said previously, you can measure the near point of uh, convergence using RF fuller. But in addition, you need to make sure that your patient has uh, accommodation deficiency as well. So that you can again do by RF ruler, or you can just uh, ask the patient to uh, read a distance chart and just try to put minus one or minus two uh, lenses. So that will stimulate the accommodation. If patient is not able to accommodation uh, accommodate minus one or minus two uh, lenses in his uh, this thing spectacle frame so that means that probably patient has accommodative insufficiency also so again as i said here you need to do a pro uh, age appropriate refraction cycloplegia uh, induced uh, refraction so in addition can give convergence exercises and when some patients are not going to improve when it is uh, neurological cause in those cases you can give basin prisms or even bifocals so whenever there's a convergence paralysis, people say that like you need to be very sure regarding this one because it's most often related to intracranial causes. So Bilchowski has said that there are certain features which uh, must be followed when you want to diagnose uh, convergence paralysis, which is like he says as like convergence paralysis initially was uh, described by Perinod. So it's mostly intracranial. So you should be having a definite intracranial pathology, preferably along the midbrain or the brainstem region. And the onset should be sudden and especially patient should appreciate diplopia for near. So where the convergence comes into action. And in addition, whatever the accommodation, people reflex as where they're preferably they are intact, sir. And in addition, whenever you measure this one repeatedly today and tomorrow on several occasions, so paralysis should remain. So it should be repeatable on several occasions. So in addition, whenever you are going to see a patient with convergence paralysis, even some patient could be malingering. So those patients are nothing but unwillingness to converge. So that means they want some attention or they might be having some other issue. So that's why they feel that uh, for near, we are not able to see. We, we do encounter these kind of patients. So uh, the malingry patients could be there in the second or third decade, preferably be female. They might be having some psychological issues or personal issues. So in those cases, if you test for streopsis and other tests, so patient just like try to observe the patient when you like when patient is not looking at you. So you might uh, pick up some hints where you can just understand, yes, patient do not have any convergence problem. Preferably they are having uh, some kind of psychological issues or attention deficit disorders. So in uh, convergence paralysis, so obviously you are not able to converge. So in those cases, of course, it is very rare. So it is better to give age appropriate refraction first. Then if it is a paretic, this thing, you can just try to give a convergence exercise for some duration just to reinforce if he has any kind of recovering tendency. So you can just naturally heal him. If at all, he's not going to heal in the end. So it is better to give basin prisms depending on the symptom equation and bifocals just to correct his near ad. So fourth one is convergence spasm. So all three were like uh, deficiency of convergence, but this is the excessive use of convergence. So here, most of the times, the literature says it could be hysterical or neurotic subjects which are who are having uh, convergence spasm. So if you go to psychiatric ward, you might feel that like some people are so tense, they are like very tense and they, uh, they, they use their accommodation so strongly. So it could be a hysterical subject. So especially second decade, third decade, 
So you need to assess the patient in total when you want to uh, diagnose convergent spasm. Just spend some time with the patients. We'll uh, get in and out of the patient what exactly the patient has. So rule out any neurological cause. If you go to medicine and other issues, you will see uh, both eyes are like converging and like they are like uh, as if they are like there is a nystagmus blockation rule. Both eyes will be adducted and they'll be positioned downwards. So, so that sort of uh, finding will be there. But more of it is neurological cause. So once you treat the neurological cause, you can address that one. Third one is uncorrected factor when patient is excessively accommodating. Really, they might end up with convergence spasm. So what are the features of convergence spasm? You are going to see that there is a sustained maximal convergence of the eyes will be there, right? So in addition, patients are going to have their uh, accommodated uh, accommodative apparatus which is into spasm position because patient is using them uh, maximally. So the ciliary body, the pupils, pupils are going to be very narrow. The ciliary body is going to be in a very spastic position. So once you diagnose this one as a uh, convergent spasm, so just try to rule out the psychiatric concerns because by addressing those things, we can just relieve the whatever the ocular symptoms are there. And if you are able to rule out any psychiatric problems, just better to get a atropine refraction done rather than going for homotropin or tropicamide, which are weak sacroplegics. So it's going to uh, completely relieve the whatever the spasm is there along the ciliary body. So you can use this just to understand the whatever the refractive error he has, which was uncorrected. And in addition, you can give that atropine as a therapeutic mode for some duration also. So which is going to relieve the uh, spasm along the ciliary body. Uh, for some duration because it's not that they are going to get rid of the spasm immediately once you put atropine for only once. So probably you need to use this uh, uh, medication for some time just you want to reinforce the relaxation often. So in addition, you can just give bifocals because whatever the uncorrected refractive error or whatever the psychological issue or if you don't get anything just like could be some sense of proximity which is stimulating the convergence spasm. If you give bifocals that is going to relax accommodative operators that's how you can just inhibit the convergence spasm. So the second mechanism is divergence. So again, it is a disjugate eye moment. So, but it is just to move away from the uh, cyclopean eye, right? So if you can see on the right side diagram, you can see uh, the white light indicates, white lines indicate that uh, a subject is looking for the near. So both the visual axis are converging symmetrically. So, but the target is very far. You can see that one, there is a small tree. So to look into that one, Mechanism. Uh, and there are so many multiple mechanisms which are involved in divergence. So there is a debate regarding uh, whether uh, divergence was active or passive. So initially, uh, so many eminent persons in strabismus they they thought they thought that like probably. Uh, Divergence is a passive phenomena. That is, uh, once you are able to relax your convergence, the eyes moves outwards. So that's how divergence happens. So subsequently, some uh, people went into uh, deep research and they were able to record the EMG recordings. You can see on the right side. So if you are going to put, uh, if you are going to put base in prism in front of the patient's eye, they are able to tolerate that fusional divergence to a certain extent. But if you go beyond eight to 10 prisms, at some point they are going to break. So if you record the EMG findings along the medial lectus and the lateral lectus at that point of time, you'll see that just before the breakage, uh, there was a tone uh, along the medial lectus muscle, there are recordings of EMG, which will go down and there is a spike along the lateral lectus muscle. So divergence is happening uh, actively. So in addition, another evidence is we are going to encounter cases with intermittent convergence squint or isophoria. So even these patients will try to maintain, as we see, intermittent divergence point, which will maintain the eyes into an orthophoric position. There's an intermittent convergence point. So patients are going to fuse or they are going to maintain the eyes into straight ahead position. So in that case also, there's a divergence phenomena, which is going to pull the eye from isophoric position to the straight right case. So there is another evidence. This is another evidence which suggests that uh, divergence is also an active phenomena. So what are the clinical concerns we can get uh, with respect to divergence is, uh, we can get divergence insufficiency or you can get divergence paralysis. So uh, what are the clinical features? So often these are going to be old age patients. So because of some musculofacial anomalies along the uh, orbital regions, so they can present with sudden onset of diplopia or like slowly progressing diplopia and you'll see some periorbital changes. 
and there is a visible isotropia or like a visual division for distance so as we saw patients are going to complain of uh, complain of uh, for near in convergence insufficiency in divergence insufficiency they are going to mainly complain of uh, iso division for distance uncross diplopia so clinical testing here uh, this is example uh, he was around like 64 years old male patient uh, who, who presented with uh, only one complaint that like i have very troublesome diplopia for distance uh, so i'm not able to do the things for distance so we asked him what is the profession he said that he got retired but still uh, he needs he wants uh, diplopic free vision for the distance However, near he is completely fine he enjoys doing his mobile work and whatever the things stitching and eating so he, he do not have any complaint for the near but particularly he is very uh, depressed for the distance vision so he is there he is having the symptoms since last year uh, august so almost like more than 30 months he has these symptoms we we are just following up this patient so you can see he is looking for the near now the eyes are completely out of it so he is looking through the window behind me just for distance you can see the left eye converges more so he has more of isotropia in the left eye for distance so that is a cause for uh, like divergence that is a, a case it's a case of divergence palsy so where for a distance patient has a definitive isotropia but here you can see the reflex corner reflex is exactly in the center but when he's looking for distance you can see uh, there's no definitive divergence which is happening so because of that one patient is having uncrossed diplopia for the distance so we we are just we have just kept this patient under follow up and we had another patient who was very young around 30 to 35 and that patient had some sort of head trauma during rta but he did not had any kind of uh, loss of consciousness but in that patient we gave some fusional uh, divergence exercise on a four. but luckily he tried to improve he's still under follow up we are not uh, considering for any surgery but this patient is having uh, quite stable this thing so we are planning to intervene this one but uh, surgically, we need to be cautious. We need to learn the literature values, what they have said in literature. Literature say that uh, the divergence palsy uh, cases are not going to be that this thing. And uh, if you do LR packation, they suggest that one. You can do LR packation or LR resection. But uh, there's a chance that patient might end up with exotropia or exophoria for the near. So he might experience diplopia for the distance. So we need to just judge each case when uh, what are their concerns, what are their needs and we can just try to uh, give a supportive treatment including exercises for some duration if they are not going to improve then we need to address whatever the intracranial causes are there divergence palsy cases often they are going to have intracranial or bridge to problems is that this patient had age related ischemic changes so that could be the cause for divergence paralysis so we need to address that one if you are able to tackle that one totally patient might uh, like he might heal over a period of time you are able to get rid of divergence palsy or you can give just prisms also over a period of time so if patient is able to improve with that one you can advise uh, prism also but surgery should be last sort because that is very unpredictable unlike whatever the routine surgeries we do treatment is again refraction age related uh, refraction in these old patients whatever the cataract is you try to take it out and give appropriate uh, refraction so fusional divergence excesses against uh, again they are indicated if patient is young if like there is an onset which is uh, kind of idiopathic with no definitive intracranial cause so in those cases we can try in all it is better to give a chance of fusional exercises in all cases if at all it is not improving you can give uh, prisms also and surgery will be a loss sort when uh, everything is not working so because surgery is not a uh, very favorable uh, thing which we should be doing but uh, that's why we should be keeping it at the last but uh, first we need to tackle the refraction fusional exercises and the preserves thank you thank you so much sir for that very crisp and very very informative uh, talk uh, pradeep sir amitava sir any comments from you before we proceed for the questions I, I can say that, you know, I, uh, my uh, hospital is part of a university uh, setup and I get all my convergence insufficiency kind of people before the exam. Uh, you see, they probably haven't studied for most of the year and yes. then they come with all these problems and my uh, postgraduates are busy doing uh, convergence deficiency checkup and insufficiency and then they want them to do these pencil push-ups. And I tell them, I said, you know, it's, it's like a gym, like an ocular gym. I said, this is not the best time because the exams are starting in two days and four days. And I recommend that they, they finish their exam somehow and they come back to me after that. And none of them do it. So I have seen this more of that uh, kind of environment in the university setups. Yes. 
So regarding the convergence, fusional convergence and sufficiency, which is much more uh, prevalent, yes, uh, that is usually not being treated properly because people advise them to do the pencil push-ups, which are not properly advised. There is no nothing wrong with the pencil push-up exercise as such. Uh, if it is monitored properly, it does work as well. But mostly people do not tell them the physiological diplopia. So mostly when people are doing, they are doing just the pencil being pushed up and uh, closer. Uh, so I generally say in a little uh, uh, lighter thing that it is, a, a, it's not pencil push-ups it's your, for your biceps. Yeah. It's not improving your convergence. It's only improving your bicep because it's only the arm which is moving and the eyes are not converging at all because he's not seeing with both the eyes. He's only seeing with one eye and one eye keeps on converging unilaterally, which is not going to be of any help. So for that reason, it's important to explain physiological diplopia so that the person has to appreciate double vision for near when he's looking far. And when he converges, he will see that the far objects become double. So during the time that he's doing a convergence, he should keep on seeing the doubling of the far objects. That is important. Unless that is being done, the pencil push-ups are only for biceps. But uh, the other way that we can give them, uh, which we mostly do is uh, on the paper, it's like uh, uh, the uh, Brock strings on paper. So there are, there's a line which is drawn with multiple dots and he's fusing on the distant most dot, converging with both the eyes and seeing at the same time two lines meeting at that dot. So this appreciation or perception of the two lines meeting at the dot ensures that both the eyes are being used. And some people who have a suppression will only keep on seeing one eye with lines. One line is there with the dots. So that is not binocular perception and it's not going to work. So you have to then do an anti-suppression to improve his ability to see with both the eyes. So regarding that, I think that is important that it's a very common thing, fusional convergence and sufficiency. And many of the children who may be in the age group, uh, like what, what you're talking, would be having a problem and they uh, will, if they do the convergence exercises properly, they would definitely benefit. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you have to do more controlled convergence exercises. And earlier it was the synoptophore, which was the basic tool. And you had to make visits to the orthoptist or the ophthalmologist uh, clinic uh, repeatedly, uh, maybe uh, five days a week or uh, for two or three weeks at a stretch to get that. Fortunately, now with the uh, technology coming in, it can be done at home uh, with uh, groups like Binox, which is giving you access possibility of exercise on your home computer uh, with the two lines being seen with red and green glasses with the, uh, you can do those exercises at home. So that's another aspect that we can train the convergence uh, insufficiency people. I think Dr. Amar has very nicely covered all the topics, that, uh, the uh, problems which can be there. Uh, it's important that when we have a case of convergence insufficiency, you should also distinguish whether he also has an associated accommodative insufficiency. So uh, accommodative insufficiency, if there is, it could be even at uh, having a, a convergence problem, which is secondary. So we need to ensure that accommodation itself is uh, correct before we diagnose it's a pure convergence insufficiency, which he did mention as the two different types of convergence insufficiency. And other thing that I would like to say is that to be, which he did mention, but just to highlight the difference between convergence insufficiency and convergence paralysis. And similarly, divergence insufficiency versus divergence paralysis. We use the term paralysis when we are suspecting a neurological problem. And in such situations, we should always do an imaging to rule out the problem which may be there, and underlying neurological conditions which several could be there. So you should always do an imaging in people whom you are suspecting a convergence paralysis. If it is uh, just an insufficiency, which is non-neurological, then you can probably do exercises or prisms that may help. But in paralysis cases, you may have to do an imaging to rule out that. The problem of uh, convergence spasm, I think he did mention, and another term which can be used is also the spasm of the near reflex, SNR. So that may be there in some people who may be having uh, the problem of convergence in spasm. That means they have an esotropia. They also have an accommodation spasm and they also have a meiosis, which should be looked into. 
if that is there, then as he mentioned, the treatment and first the diagnostic pass part is by the atropinization. And then as a therapeutic thing, you have to use atropine for long periods, maybe for months, not just weeks. And at that time, you have to give them a plus uh, reading glasses so that their studies are not affected, but they have to be on uh, atropine. These people may be having neurosis. And that is why psychological assessment should be done and a treatment by the psychiatrist may be required in many of them. They may be having hysterical problem, sometimes because of the stress of exams that they do present with this. So that is something which we need to see. And again, as I said, in such cases, imaging would be done to rule out a problem which may be there. During the lockdown, we did get several of such cases of acute esotropias with accommodation spasm. And we needed to do an atropine test first before we uh, think of doing a surgery and that too after only three months of waiting should be done. So these are the certain terms and conditions. Another thing which I would like to mention is the divergence in sufficiency in elderly. Uh, I mean, this is something which if you are careful, you will notice. So how do you distinguish a divergence in sufficiency from a bilateral sixth nerve paresis? That is a common question which I think residents of PGs would have to be uh, asked. That what, how do you distinguish a, a bilateral paresis of uh, sixth nerve versus that divergence in sufficiency? So in that case, I think what we need to do is that uh, you have an esotropia, which is more for distance in divergence in sufficiency compared to the, the near. For near fixation, whereas a bilateral sixth nerve palsy would have the same amount of esotropia both for distance and near. So that is one distinguishing point. The other point is lateral versions. On the lateral versions, if you find the esotropia is uh, worsening, that is again a bilateral sixth nerve palsy. Whereas uh, divergence insufficiency, you would have lessening of the esotropia on lateral versions. So that would be a distinguishing point. And if there is a divergence insufficiency, as I said, you should distinguish divergence paralysis first. And if you are ensured that no neurological cause is there, and if surgery is being planned, uh, Dr. Deemer's uh, thought is there that there may be in some of these people the heterotopia of the uh, pulleys. So the lateral lectus pulleys may be dystopic or uh, down position. And he has uh, found that uh, upshifting of the lateral lecti may be more beneficial than just a resection of the lateral lectus. So, I mean, that is one thing which we uh, have to keep in mind. So we may have to upshift the lateral lecti in addition to strengthening the lateral lecti in divergence insufficiency cases. Interestingly, recently in, the, uh, in a talk, uh, keynote addressed by Dr. Lionel Cowell, he mentioned about convergence insufficiency cases being helped by a medial lectus being upshifted. So that's an interesting new thought which has come and he has done in some cases, the medial recti are upshifted. So we have seen that some of these cases by just bimedial resections of plications do not get corrected as desired. I mean, you get a result of some time and then they again have a problem. So in such a situation, I mean, that thought also can be added that you can upshift the medial recti, either uh, just like that or in addition with resection. So these are some, I think, points I would like to add. And then we can have some questions, Dr. Shifali. Yes, sir. Uh, so the first one is, can you explain about the angle of convergence and its clinical relevance? Sorry, come again. Angle of convergence? Yeah. Convergence and its clinical relevance. Okay, angle of convergence, I, I, I feel you are asking how to measure the uh, convergence, right? So there are two ways to measure the convergence. So one is beta angle and second one is what are the distance you are going to measure. So when you are going to uh, uh, measure the distance, so for example, if at one meter I am going to converge, so that means I am accommodating one diopter of accommodation and also I am exerting one diopter, one prism diopter of uh, convergence also. So that is like almost inverse uh, inverse relation. So at one meter, it is like uh, one adapter of accommodation and one prism adapter of this thing. For half meter, it will be one and a half. That means two, right? It will be inverse. For like two meters, it will be one. So in that way, you can uh, calculate in terms of meter angle or you can just calculate on the RF ruler where you want to document where is the uh, near point of convergence, which is either receding or like becoming normal. Hmm. Uh, I'll go on to the next one. How do you differentiate between accommodative convergence and versus proximal convergence? 
so acha okay so if you want to measure accommodative convergence you should be giving some sort of accommodative target right so if i am going to see something here like sense something some threat is coming that is a reflex so proximal convergence is a sense of proximity which will induce convergence right so at that time even the lens is also working so if you want to measure how much he is going to exert only accommodative convergence then you can induce minus 1 minus 2 lenses so you can just see how much convergence he is able to induce in recent octs even you can induce minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 adapter of accommodation also so that will bring again the convergence so in that way if you want to measure purely accommodative convergence that is one part if you want to uh, say about like proximal convergence it is going to be more of reflex rather than quantifiable sir anything would you would like to add no i think that's right that we need to distinguish and the feeling of a, a object being close that excites the extra convergence which comes in that is known as the proximal convergence so that would be there even if the eyes are closed and if a person is made to feel that something is uh, coming close his eyes would converge so that is the uh, instrument convergence earlier it was called on synoptophore that's why we found that the fusional convergence measured on synoptophore would be much more then what we'll measure on the prism uh, bar yeah. because of the instrument convergence which is there so that is uh, the difference which makes a thing so as he has mentioned the real test would be to have an accommodative target or you can have uh, accommodation induced by inducing the uh, minus lenses so that the person is made to accommodate on the accommodative target through the minus lenses and that would definitely cause a uh, in induced accommodation Which will which will not be uh, the proximal convergence. Uh, okay. Next one is what should be our approach in managing uh, consecutive convergence insufficiency consecutive to uh, like recession of MR or resection of LR. So whenever we have done uh, MR recession and that has led to convergence insufficiency, you just need to look whether had patient had some sort of uh, probably he had isotropia. so you need to look whether he has consecutive exotropia also so in those cases rather than just active uh, convergence insufficiency patient has divergence also i mean to say there is a consecutive exotropia also so probably because of intraoperative miss uh, measurements or like uh, there could be stretching of the scar or there could be slippage of the muscle that has led to uh, subnormal convergence so probably you need to look for the uh, muscles once again what is the amount of fixation where the probably muscle is so by just like if you have any kind of con uh, consecutive uh, exotropia for near so depending on the deviation you just advance the medial latissimus muscle probably that could be the reason there so if uh, even after advancing the muscle if even after achieving the uh, orthophoric testing if patient is still not able to converge probably he might be having convergence insufficiency or some other factor could be there so based on that one we can just give uh, bifocals or even uh, prisms also we can just prescribe amitabha sir anything you want to add I, I think uh, Dr. Amar has covered that uh, aspect, but that's an interesting point. I mean, the, I think what this, this person is asking is, will exercise help here or not? And the chances are that they may not. Possibly, is over uh, responded to the surgery, and therefore there is now a convergence deficiency, not that the usual insufficiency that we were talking about more or less. So you may need to go back, and you know, maybe a mini plication of the medial recti might help. It may give that little extra strength to help. i think here the uh, thing is what i think one would then try to differentiate a stimulus ac by a ratio and a reflex ac by ratio by doing a surgery we are altering the ac by ratio as a reflex but if you see if you could do a, a linear uh, plotting then probably you can say that the ac by ratio is still maintained the same but here there is a change by uh, because your um, mechanism of assessment has been changed so by doing a surgery you have altered so as uh, we say that ac by ratio is an individual identity it doesn't change with age but it can be altered artificially by surgery or maybe by giving let's say uh, 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 phenylephrine or anything which will a uh, cholinergic drug which will again facilitate accommodation and increase so at both stimulus as well as the reflex side you could alter the ac by ratio so yes surgery does alter it so when you are measuring you will feel that there is a little difference now uh, post surgery okay can you elaborate on accommodative effort syndrome i am not sure sir can say something regarding this what is this term i mean accommodative effort syndrome or does it mean that 
uh, again like in a different way a, a, a near reflex spasm spasm okay. no? because in that there is an accommodative effort spasm which comes in and that's also known as a spasm of near reflex i'm not sure whether the query is that but mm -hmm. the spasm of near reflex involves all the three aspects of the near vision complex that is accommodation spasm conversion spasm and the meiosis which may be neurological so that has to be kept in mind mm. okay sir uh, next one is can convergence insufficiency coexist with accommodative insufficiency yes that we have covered it can coexist we did say that we need also always to uh, differentiate a convergence insufficiency that accommodative insufficiency is there mm. Uh, the next one is quantitatively how much should be the NPC from the baseline for diagnosis of convergence insufficiency so if you want to say clinically there are no strict bars but if you like take 10 subjects and if you assess near point of convergence in Indian subjects probably you are going to get uh, somewhere between 8 to 10 centimeters and again it is age specific so if you are going to measure between 5 to 10 years the kid is able to converge more so obviously his near point of convergence will be somewhere 6 to 8 centimeters so if it in second decade, it could be somewhere eight to 10 centimeters. If it's third and fourth decade, it can receive. So you need to just look into the age and then you can decide uh, what is the near point of convergence after measurement, probably uh, using a standard instrument. And after that, you need to take uh, into consideration what is patient exactly, what is the patient's concern. So if he has any kind of like astronomic symptom, uh, there is a diplopia, there's a blooding, there's a kind of headache and like things are just crowding each other. So letters are running here and there. So that sort of like astronomic symptoms are there, which has, which are like a critical of convergence insufficiency. So your symptoms and your measurements you can put together, then you can address it. So it is, if you're going to consider only one factor, I feel uh, you might be getting misled. So in those cases, it is better to uh, put them together than counsel the patient what he needs and what is his uh, like problem. So that will be a better st uh, strategy just rather than focusing on NPC. Is there anything you would want to add? No, I think that's right. Basically, you have to go by the RAF rule and you can see the distance where he's uh, breaking into two objectively or he'll, uh, the person will complain of diplopia. So, I mean, you have to see the motor observation also. I mean, you'll see that the eyes are at the break point that they start drifting till that they are converging. So it's not just the patient's response subjectively, but objectively also you will see the break point of the two and then when you come back there is a recovery that is made so both break points and the recovery point should also be assessed when we are measuring the RAF I, I also believe that you know very often these are just numbers and we should not go with the idea of treating numbers I mean just because it's just beyond 12 centimeters so we think it's an abnormal thing and we must uh, you know give the person pencil pressure it's also uh, I've seen that you know when you see the general health of the child or the person sitting in front of you, that thinly built person, weak, stressed out for so many issues, not sure about a job, he's not going to perform very well on even when you check for the conversions. And you know, to send that person for pencil push-ups, his background is so much stressed out, it, it doesn't work like that. We need to individualize approach to the patients. Okay, sir. And so one of our viewers wants to know, how do we differentiate between convergence insufficiency, convergence paralysis and convergence spasm? So as I uh, like just mentioned in the slide, so convergence spasm has a typical symptom where eyes will be locked inside and there will be meiotic pupil and like it's a kind of painful situation. So that is typical uh, feature. So convergence insufficiency, as you know, the uh, near point of convergence has receded and patient has asymmetric symptoms. So depending on the eye position and depending on the patient concern and depending on the examination findings. So in, uh, in, in case of convergence spasm, you won't be able to elicit any NPC, right? So just by clinically observing the patient, uh, just looking at the pupil and the eye position, you can say it is a spasm. And by just observing the clinical symptoms and just giving a target, just seeing where is the NPC or like it has received back, that's how you can diagnose insufficiency. Okay. Convergence uh, paralysis is going to be neurological yes, sir. will be similar to convergence insufficiency but if it has a neurological problem so it was described by Perlia. yes and so the last one for the day is can you please explain about the acquired motor fusion deficiency okay uh -huh. yeah that was the i think 
uh, in one notes the uh, the same chapter that is the last thing which is there i think dr amar has not covered that yeah acquired motor fusion deficiency may be there after trauma or some uh, injury even after uh, so this is the real problem this is some of the problem which we have no definite answer so if you have a person who has had a head injury and you see that he is complaining of diplopia you do the on the synapto for assessment you try to fuse any never fuses he will keep on having diplopia it's like the two never meet it's like a quarreling couple who cannot be uh, put to one point you give prisms it doesn't work you do a surgery you are going to fail so these you have to be on the watch out before surgery i mean you should be there counsel them that if there is a such situation like this and we have encountered such patients after surgery who keep on complaining of diplopia you give them prisms it doesn't work or maybe work only for some time and uh, as i think even von nuden has uh, remarked in his uh, conclusion part that there is no definite answer it may recede on its own by itself with god's grace or sometimes the only thing would be to give an opaque contact lens or a patch to take care of the diplopia so acquired motor uh, fusional disturbance is a real problem fortunately rare uh, it may be like horror fusionist that has been talked about but this is something which we do encounter and sometimes post paralytic strabismus surgery we do encounter such patients that they have had a, a cortical fusion disruption which manifests in the form of uh, this acquired fusion disturbance so with that i think we have covered all the questions for the evening uh, thank you again amar sir for uh, being here with us and for that excellent talk and uh, pradeep sharma sir and amrita sir for that discussion uh, any concluding remarks from both of you sir thank you shefali i think you have done a wonderful job once again as a moderator and anchor and yes, dr amar has covered so nicely this complex subject dr amitava for his beautiful remarks and i would like to uh, thank you all for being present here listening to this talk so we uh, can have now the introduction for the next speak topic and the speaker so the next is none other uh, but uh, our very own amitava sir with the topic is all you wanted to know about nystagmus on october 7 So see you all on October seventh. Okay, bye bye and good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay, everybody. Good night. Yeah.